Thanks very much to New Phytologist and the organizers um, for organizing this and inviting me. I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, so last talk of the conference, and um, there's going to be some chemistry in it, so I hope that won't be too, too painful. Um, but I'm very interested, and my group is very interested, in the molecules um, that plants make. And I think you've heard, you've heard a little bit about this um, over the last day or two. Um, but just as a reminder, um, plants make many, many molecules that have fabulously interesting and important applications. Um, so for example, digoxin, which comes from common fox, foxglove, um, has been used to treat a variety of cardiac um, ailments for hundreds of years. Um, and to get these plant-derived compounds into the clinic, typically, even today, we extract them from the whole plant, or we extract advanced precursors from the plant and then do some chemistry on them. And so the hope is, and I think that many of you already know this or are actively contributing to this, um, is that next generation sequencing, bioinformatic approaches, and uh, what we loosely call synthetic biology really have the power to bring the medicinal plant metabolism really into the 21st century. And this is just a slide with just four samplings of um, secondary metabolites or specialized metabolites or natural products. Those terms are used uh, somewhat interchangeably um, that are produced from plants, um, and they all have uh, very important uses. Um, they, the names may be recognizable to many of you. They're all used in the clinic for one reason or another. Um, and the point that I want to make is that the biosynthetic pathways that construct these molecules have not been completely elucidated for any of these molecules. And so given the importance of these molecules and the sort of the hundreds and thousands of graduate student and postdoc hours that have been put into studying these biosynthetic pathways, um, I think that's really sort of a testament to how challenging um, understanding plant metabolism can be. Um, so what I want to do is talk about um, our group's um, approaches um, and progress in studying how plants make some of these complicated small molecules, um, and we're interested in understanding these metabolic pathways, partly from sort of a fundamental biochemistry perspective. We're very interested in how plants do complex chemistry. We're interested in understanding how these enzymes catalyze these reactions that put these molecules together, and potentially understanding how and why the, the, the plants um, put these enzymes together in, in, in these pathways in the way that they do. And then, of course, there's also obvious practical benefits to understanding plant metabolism. So for example, vimblastin, which is made by Madagascar periwinkle or Catharanthus roseus. This is um, a potent anti-cancer drug that acts on uh, microtubule formation. It was discovered in the middle of the 20th century. It's isolated from the leaves of Catharanthus and very low yield, hence it's expensive. Um, we could imagine that if we knew all of the enzymes that made up vimblastin biosynthesis, we could reconstitute those enzymes in a different host organism like Nicotiana benthanyama or yeast or E. coli, and then maybe uh, trick that organism or program that organism into making larger quantities of vimblastin. Or maybe we could even fiddle around with the biosynthetic pathways and instead of making vimblastin itself, make analogs or derivatives of vimblastin that might have new and improved um, biological properties. Okay, so um, how do we go about thinking about how a natural product or a specialized metabolite is made? And um, you know, a lot of times you just sort of see a bunch of structures put up on a slide um, representing the start to finish, and a lot of work typically went into, into drawing that or coming up with the rationale behind that figure. And just, uh, just very quickly, I'm not going to get into it, um, really the, 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 the background behind this slide um, has been a lot of labeling studies. So in other words, taking isotopically labeled precursors and feeding them into the plant and seeing which ones get incorporated into the final product and which ones don't. Um, a lot of isolation of biosynthetic intermediates, so grinding up the plant, trying to fish out these very, very small quantities of various intermediates along the way in the pathway, and then solving their structures. And then using chemical intuition in combination with these two approaches to try to put a, a chemically reasonable set of steps together um, that, that would lead to the final product. Uh, utilizing the structure of the intermediates that hopefully you've, you've been able to elucidate. Okay, so how is vimblastin made? 
Um, well, you can look, you can see it's made up of two um, sections, both of which have a, an indole, or in this case, something that looks something like it was derived from an indole. And if you see an indole in um, a specialized metabolite, it probably means that trip, the amino acid tryptophan was involved. And in this case, um, the plant actually decarboxylates tryptophan to make this tryptamine here, so just lacking that CO2 there. Um, you can also see there's a whole bunch of other carbons on both of these monomers as well, which I've highlighted in red. And if you count the carbons, and again, having a little bit of chemical intuition and using some labeling studies, that tells you that these um, red uh, bonds here are derived from a monoterpene. And um, by isolating some biosynthetic intermediates, uh, people were able to determine that actually the monoterpene involved in vinblastin biosynthesis is this very crazy looking uh, monoterpene, which I'll talk more about, uh, which is called secaloganin. And if you put tryptamine and secaloganin together, um, it's very easy to see that um, they, the, how they come together to form this other isolated biosynthetic intermediate, which is called strictocidin, um, which can then go on to rearrange to form these more derivatized uh, compounds here, catharanthine and vindaline. And it's, again, fairly straightforward to map catharanthine onto one half of the vinblastin molecule and vindaline onto the other half of the uh, uh, vinblastin molecule. And presumably the plant dimerizes these two advanced biosynthetic intermediates together to give the final product. And in fact, in the commercial production of vinblastin, um, typically vinblastin itself is not isolated from the plant, but catharanthine and vindaline are isolated, and they can be chemically dimerized together in a, in a fairly straightforward um, chemical synthesis. So in terms of the um, enzymes that are used to construct these, uh, or to actually catalyze these chemical conversions, we, we only know, or at the time that we started this, we really only knew a, a fraction of them. So we know there's a tryptophan decarboxylase, which does this um, conversion of tryptophan to tryptamine. We really only knew one out of uh, three or four of the enzymes required to convert the starting terpene, geraniol, into this um, intermediate of uh, secaloganin, which is called nepotolactol. And secaloganin is a type of uh, monoterpene known as an iridoid, and nepotolactol is the common scaffold um, for, these, for this class of terpenes known as iridoids. And it, it, it's, it, it was not at the time known how um, nepotolactol was synthesized from geraniol. Um, we know the enzyme that condenses tryptamine and secaloganin together. We know that strictosidin gets deglycosylated by a dedicated glucosidase enzyme. We know very few of the steps after strictosidin glucosidase. We do know some of the tailoring enzymes that put some of the functional groups on vindaline, but that, that really um, is about it. Okay. So we decided to focus on this part of the pathway, um, partly because it made sense to sort of begin at the beginning, particularly if we were interested in thinking about reconstituting this pathway in host organisms. Um, but also we were very, from a chemical perspective, we were very intrigued by the chemistry involving the conversion of this fairly simple linear molecule into this much more complicated um, fused ring structure here. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, this represents iridoid biosynthesis, and iridoids are a specialized class of monoterpenes that are derived from geraniol. And so what we knew at the time is that geraniol is the um, uh, committed precursor, and this is hydroxylated by a P450 to give this dihydroxy uh, compound. And then this hydroxy uh, uh, compound is oxidized by an alcohol dehydrogenase um, enzyme to give this dialdehyde. And it's this dialdehyde that's actually the immediate pre precursor for uh, this compound, nepotolactol, which, as I mentioned, is the framework of the iridoid skeleton. This is the common intermediate for all iridoid monoterpenes. And this five, six-membered ring structure that's fused together, this is really the kind of the, the definitive um, uh, structure of the, uh, of the iridoids. Um, so nepotolactol, of course, goes on to form um, the downstream alkaloids in Catharanthus roseus, like uh, vinblastin. Um, the iridoids are also an interesting um, 
set of structures um, in and of themselves. The simplest uh, iridoid that's found in nature is nepotalactone, which is found in uh, Nepata cataria, which is the active ingredient in catnip. So I actually hadn't really realized this until we started working on this pathway, and I was, I was very excited <laughs> to be working on catnip. Um, you, you never sort of expect these things uh, when, when you start working on a pathway. Um, in, in, a, in addition to that, uh, slightly more uh, uh, important uh, applications of these, uh, of these compounds. Um, some of them have pharmacological activity. Uh, many of them also um, have important uses in agrochemistry. So um, these iridoids are either uh, produced or uh, sequestered by various insects, and these play a role um, in sort of uh, signaling um, with insects and can be used as repellents or attractants, which, which is very, very important. Okay. So um, the other point that I want to make, and this was the other reason why we were very interested in this section of this pathway, is that this is very, this biosynthesis, uh, this chemistry, it's very different from how normal or canonical monoterpenes are made. So normally, um, nature makes this precursor called geraniol pyrophosphate, um, and then a terpene cyclase will uh, catalyze the ionization or the leaving of this pyrophosphate group to generate a carbocation. Um, and then the combination of this carbocation and the double bonds in the molecule uh, then facilitates a rearrangement process to give lots and lots of different possibilities. I've just shown limonene here as one example. Additionally, um, this uh, uh, carbocation intermediate, instead of cyclizing, can also be quenched with water, so a molecule of water can just come in and attack here, and that's actually how geraniol is synthesized. So then in, in the case of iridoid biosynthesis, um, uh, we start off uh, on this pathway, but geraniol is made and then gets fed into this, uh, this alternative branch. All right. So um, how do we go about figuring out what this missing step is? Um, and we've used what many, many other groups have used very successfully, uh, namely transcriptomic data. Um, and this is part of an NIH-funded um, uh, program um, uh, called the Medici Medicinal Plant Genomics um, Consortium. And um, you can find all of the background as well as the raw data on this website here. So um, how do you go about using transcriptome data to fish for gene candidates? And I know many, many of you in the audience already know this. Um, we use co-expression analysis. Um, so the idea is, is that if you can guess what type of enzyme might be required in your chemical transformation, like for example, if you're looking for something that puts a, a hydroxyl group on a molecule, you might guess that a P450 is involved. That's, that's not a bad guess. And then we make the assumption that all genes in a pathway will co-express. They'll all have similar expression profiles. So we look um, among our contigs that, in, for example, would be annotated as a P450, and we select the annotated P450s that are closest expressing uh, with respect to a known gene. Uh, so for example, we take um, of emblastin biosynthetic genes that have been identified earlier, and then we look to see what, for example, P450s might be expressed most uh, similarly to those known genes. Um, and there are some problems with this approach. Um, for example, um, the contigs might be uh, not annotated or they might be misannotated. Um, and actually, in the case of looking for this iridoid uh, synthase enzyme, our guess of what type of enzyme might be wrong. So this is particularly true for the most interesting and unprecedented type of chemistry. Um, you might not know what type of enzyme actually catalyzes the reaction, and so it's difficult to make an initial guess based on the protein family. So really, a better approach is to try to do a database-wide co-expression analysis. Um, and to try to make this problem a little bit simpler, um, we try to think of clever ways to do, um, or straightforward ways to do, um, an initial filtering of our contigs. So for example, in the case of um, vinblastin biosynthesis, we know that vinblastin and all of its precursors are uh, synthesized in leaf. So we were able to eliminate many, many transcripts um, based on a filtering process where the uh, transcripts had to have some baseline level of expression in our leaf tissues. And then we also were able to obtain RNA-seq data for um, seedlings that had been subjected to methyl jasminate treatment. And it was well studied that methyl jasminate will upregulate production of vinblastin and all of its precursors. So we set in a filtering where we had to see higher expression of, of um, 
of contigs in these methyl jasminate treated seedlings. And so what we could see when we looked at our um, transcriptome data or our, our RNA-seq data um, is that we could see the, early, the um, genes from the early part of the vinblast and biosynthetic pathway that includes this um, iridoid section of the pathway are actually arranged in a, in a, in a cluster, essentially, of, um, and in this case, of about 100 or so transcripts. So this was really fantastic news because trying to look for an unknown enzyme in a group of 100 is a lot easier than looking for an unknown enzyme in the, you know, 35,000 or so genes that are expressed in Catharanthus roseus. And so um, we specifically focused on looking for genes that co-expressed with this P450 that, put the hydro that puts the hydroxyl group in this position here, G10H. Um, and so uh, what we could do is, I mean, we could just sort of start at the beginning and, and go through 100 or so genes and, and look to, uh, that were most similarly co-expressed with G10H and look and see which one did the job. Um, but it's actually nicer if you can narrow that down a little bit further. And this is where some chemical intuition um, really helped streamline this process. And we were very, very fortunate um, because Meinhard Zenk's group back in the 1980s actually looked into this problem a little bit. And Zenk was able to take crude plant extracts and incubate them with this substrate. And what he found was that to get maximal activity, you needed an NADPH cofactor. So that was a big clue to us that this enzyme that catalyzes iridoid biosynthesis is an enzyme that requires um, an NADPH cofactor. And when we go and we look at our list of genes that share um, expression similarity to G10H, um, one of the first hits that we saw was a contig that was annotated as progesterone 5-beta uh, reductase. And we know that this is a gene that requires NADPH. So the progesterone 5-beta reductases are found very widely throughout the plant kingdom. Um, biochemical studies have shown that they have broad substrate specificity. Um, and the endogenous functions, the native functions of these enzymes in plants are just not that clear. In many cases, they're believed to be involved in um, triterpenoid biosynthesis, uh, car cartilolide biosynthesis, but they're also found in plants that don't make these compounds. So it's, it's a little bit of a mystery what, what these enzymes are, are doing much of the time. But in terms of the chemistry, uh, we know that progesterone beta reductases, they're, they're reduced, they're reductants, um, and they use an NADPH cofactor. So NADPH basically just donates H minus. This is hydrogen with uh, an electron pair on it. And this H minus is the reductant. It, it goes in and it attacks this double bond here. It does this sort of rearrangement to form what's called an enol. So basically, you're just moving the electrons from this double bond to here and then generating a carbon-oxygen single bond. Um, and then this can spontaneously rearrange to form this. So basically, you're just doing a net reduction of this double bond. Now, progesterone looks nothing like this dialdehyde substrate that iridoid, um, this putative iridoid synthase is supposed to use. But actually, if you kind of line it up uh, with progesterone beta reductase, you can kind of see that sort of key functional group, this double bond and this carbonyl, it's the same in both molecules. And so we could propose using this mechanism that Zenk had um, written out in 1987, that the H minus from the NADPH cofactor could attack here. That would enable formation of this five-membered ring. And then we could um, actually get a spontaneous uh, formation of the second ring just by attack of this alcohol onto this aldehyde here. So we thought that this progesterone reductase was actually a good candidate. And so we could clone it out. We could express it in E. coli. It expresses pretty well. We can get the enzymatic product, um, and we can actually characterize it by NMR, and it's identical to, a, uh, to an authentic standard. And just sort of fun trivia fact, uh, how did we get the authentic standard? Um, you can actually do a reduction of nepotolactone, that active ingredient in catnip, to, to, to get this compound. And you can go on the web and you can actually buy like liters of nepotolactone. And so Nat Sheridan dist was distilling the essential oil of catnip um, and purifying nepotolactone and then reducing it. And um, I would bring things home from the lab and the cat that I had at home just went berserk. Um, anyway, so it's, it's fun working with these biologically active compounds. <laughs> um, and then, um, we can do in vitro uh, steady state kinetics and ensure that this um, is actually uh, 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 performing the reaction with sort of appropriate uh, kinetic parameters. 
Um, we're still working on the mechanism, uh, the details of the mechanism of this enzyme. Um, I'll just note that there's a key mutation uh, compared to progesterone beta reductase in what we believe is the active site, a tyrosine to a histidine. We've made mutants of this. This doesn't really switch the activity. It doesn't convert, you know, a progesterone beta reductase into an iridoid synthase. So there's, there's more to the story that's remaining to be discovered, but we're in the process of trying to get some structural data for iridoid synthase, and I hope this is going to shed some light on really how this enzyme works and also maybe how it evolved uh, from this uh, uh, family of progesterone beta reductases. Um, we can also look at the function of this enzyme in vivo. Um, so a former postdoc in the lab um, worked out how to do VIGS virus-induced gene silencing in Catharanthus roseus, and so we can silence this um, cyc cyclizing enzyme and look to see a decrease in the formation of downstream um, alkaloid products. So that, that really kind of suggests that this enzyme is actually functioning in vivo. Um, so, to just think a little bit about how this enzyme works, um, I sort of drew the mechanism or the, a the arrows uh, uh, showing the movement of the bond formation like Zank did, uh, where everything sort of all happened at once. And if you take a look at the stereochemistry, uh, so whether these bonds are pointing up or down um, as Nat did, um, this is basically impossible. It just it, 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 there's sort of no room for this to happen. Um, basically just means that this cofactor sort of has to be in the middle of, of everything, and it, 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 it's just not chemically reasonable. So we went back to the sort of the way that the progesterone beta reductase happens, and as I mentioned, it proceeds through this initial reduction here to form what I call this enol here that then spontaneously sort of uh, rearranges. And so we think that's basically how um, this iridoid cyclize works, that first there's an, an initial reduction reaction and then cyclization happens. And to kind of show this, we looked at the substrate specificity of a whole bunch of um, different substrate analogs that were capable of being reduced. So in other words, they had a, a double bond here, but they couldn't cyclize because they were sort of missing some key component of the other end of the molecule. And what we can see is we can, for example, we can see conversion of this substrate here it can get reduced without being cyclized. And so what we believe is that we get what's called an enone reduction. So all that means is that we're reducing this double bond here to form that moiety that's called an enol, that exactly like what happens in progesterone beta reductase. And then once we get this so-called enol, then that's set up to nicely rearrange to form first the five-membered ring and then the six-membered ring uh, by forming this bond here. And so, again, we were very excited about this um, because, really, this is kind of a, a different way of making terpenes. Uh, so, as I mentioned, canonical terpene cyclases proceed via this cationic intermediate that results from the ionization of this pyrophosphate group followed by sort of just rearrangement and reaction of the uh, double bonds with that uh, cat cation, um, whereas this cyclase utilizes a reduction reaction followed by a, um, a subsequent cyclization. Um, we're very interested in exploring how we can sort of combine um, the ability to do reduction with these types of substrates to make new and interesting structures, um, either for uh, just chemical purposes um, or biocatalysis purposes. So can we generate new and interesting biocatalysts that make complicated molecules that might be hard to make um, from a synthetic chemistry perspective? And then also, again, from kind of an evolutionary perspective, um, can we look and see what uh, other enzymes um, are found in plants or other organisms, and um, are there any similar uh, types of, of uh, reductions, reduction cyclizations uh, that, that are also found in nature? And just as kind of a proof of concept, um, what we did was we took a reductase that is actually, um, it's involved in ergot alkaloid biosynthesis in a fungus. And, and we, use this, we use this reductase because we had it in the lab, because we've, we, a, a, a graduate student had been working on this uh, 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 biochemical transformation. And so we took our substrate that catharanthus uses for nepotylactol formation, and we incubated it uh, with this fungal enzyme, which is called Ease A. And we saw not Unsurprisingly, just the reduced product, so our um, Ease A just simply reduced one of the double bonds and just kind of left it at that. But we also saw a completely, in a, you know, this not 
um, unrespectable ratio, a completely different type of cyclized structure. So this is, and then we could show that a little bit more rigorously uh, by characterizing the structure by NMR. So I mean, this really suggests that there is some plasticity that if we can take several different families of reductases, um, we might be able to, um, uh, those uh, uh, substrates can fold up in various different ways in the active sites of these different reductases to form a variety of different structures. Um, and so we're currently in the process of looking at lots and lots of different uh, reductases from plants and other organisms, and also making analogs of 10 oxogeraniol that have that are shorter or longer or have different numbers of methyl groups on them and trying to see sort of what different types of compounds we, we can make using this enzymatic, um, using this enzymatic reaction. Um, so that's kind of a story about how we um, can use um, transcriptomic data to sort of find the missing pieces um, in these uh, complicated natural product biosynthetic pathways. And I mentioned um, in passing um, that while one application of this work might be to make a heterologous organism that makes lots and lots of emblastin, um, what if we could fiddle around with the pathways um, to make uh, um, uh, compounds that had uh, certain changes or certain derivatizations um, that might really improve or enhance um, the biological uh, activity of, of these compounds. Now, um, it's difficult to reconstitute vimblast in, in a heterologous organism because even though we're making progress in identifying all the enzymes, we're still not there yet. That's our goal. It's, that's the goal of a number of groups, and I, I'm, I suspect it will happen relatively quickly. Um, but for now, if we want to play around with these biosynthetic pathways, what we need to do is we need to actually do it in Catharanthus roseus itself. So using a variety of different techniques, um, such as feeding experiments um, uh, and others, um, we, we could determine that the biosynthetic enzymes of vimblast and biosynthesis are actually relatively plastic and will accept a variety of different substrate analogs to go on and make alkaloid um, derivatives. And in one example, what we were able to do was we were able to take um, a, a tail, what are called tailoring enzymes um, from bacterial biosynthetic pathways. Um, and the two examples I'm showing here are uh, REB-H and PIR-H. And these are uh, halogenases, and what they do is they put chlorines on tryptophan. So they, these are used in bacterial antibiotic synthesis, and these antibiotics that are made by these bacteria happen to um, have a chlorine on an indole, and these are the enzymes that are actually um, do, doing that job. Um, and so what um, we had imagined was that we could take either REB-H or PIR-H and transform them into Catharanthus roseus. And these enzymes would actually encounter uh, tryptophan in Catharanthus roseus. And then the native or the endogenous tryptophan decarboxylase that's found in Catharanthus roseus, we hoped, would be able to decarboxylate these chlorinated versions of tryptophan. And in fact, this was true. We, were, we actually um, cloned out and overexpressed tryptophan decarboxylase and did some biochemical analysis. And we were able to show that um, the catharanthus tryptophan decarboxylase could, in fact, accept these chlorinated uh, tryptophans, though at a, a significantly uh, decreased efficiency compared to the uh, native uh, tryptophan substrate. But nevertheless, um, we thought that it would be, based on these kinetic parameters, we thought it would be reasonable to expect that Catharanthus roseus would be able to generate these chlorinated um, tryptamine analogs in situ, and these are the direct precursors um, for uh, vimblastin as well as a number of other biosynth biosynthetically related um, alkaloids that are also derived from uh, uh, tryp uh, tryptamine. And so um, sure enough, we were able to do this. We were able to transform um, REB-H and PIR-H into um, tissue culture, hairy root tissue culture of Catharanthus roseus. And then we could um, clone out, uh, sorry, purify um, various um, chlorinated uh, natural products that, result, that resulted uh, from, this, um, from this experiment. And this is just one example here. Um, we can actually do this a little bit um, in a little bit more sophisticated manner. Um, so it's actually, I don't think it's great to make a chlorinated um, 
amino acid in the plant. Um, this amino acid is not just being used in alkaloid biosynthesis or natural product biosynthesis, it's being used for all sorts of other things as well. So it would be nice to, if we're going to make an analog, um, it'd be nice to, to, to do that, um, to have that analog making reaction actually a little bit later on in the pathway when the pathway is actually fully committed uh, to natural product biosynthesis. And, and so we know that we won't be interfering with um, any other pathways. And so um, we had the idea that instead of um, chlorinating tryptophan, what if we just directly chlorinated tryptamine? And so if you happen to know the structure of the active site of the chlorinating enzyme, and we did, uh, because uh, uh, Kathy Drennan and Chris Walsh had crystallized uh, REV-H, we can look at the active site structure and try to make some changes to it. Um, we did this in what we call a semi-rational way. It's not completely rational because we never honestly completely know what we're doing when we try to engineer the substrate specificity or the product specificity of an enzyme. Um, but it's a little bit tricky to do true directed evolution um, with, uh, uh, w with these types of reactions. We just really didn't have a good selection or a screen to enable us to go through hundreds of thousands of, 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 of different mutants. So we made about uh, 50 or so mutants sort of in the active site region. And um, the graduate student, Wes, just happened upon one that really was successful. He noted that this uh, tyrosine residue seemed to interact with the uh, carbonyl of tryptophan. And he rationalized that if we made this tyrosine or if we mutated it into a bigger amino acid, this would disrupt the binding of tryptophan because there would be no more room for the uh, carboxyl group to bind. Um, but maybe it would allow binding of tryptamine. And this was, in fact, the case. Um, so Wes could um, uh, show that we saw uh, he could transform this into Catharanthus roseus hairy roots. And when he looked uh, for production of chlorinated tryptophan, he saw absolutely nothing. He also saw no conversion in vitro as well, but I'm not showing the biochemistry here. And then we could also see production of this compound that, that, that we saw in the previous experiment as well. Um, so again, if we sort of know something about the pathway and we know something about the, the structure and the mechanism of these enzymes, we can sort of refine and refine and, and make this um, a, a, even more efficient. And I just want to highlight, um, uh, so you know, people ask, why chlorines? What, what's so great about chlorines? And a, a lot of um, drugs do have halogens such as fluorine, chlorine, and bromine on them. They're just, they're good hydrogen bonding acceptors. They have some very nice pharmacological properties. Um, so that's, it's a, it's a sort of a good group that medicinal chemists like to add on to, to, to um, natural product scaffolds to, to, to see how they modulate the activity or the pharmacokinetics of a molecule. But there's another reason why chlorines um, are interesting, and that's because they actually serve as a handle for further derivatization. Um, so sort of um, inspired by the work of uh, Rebecca Goss, who's now at St. Andrews, who did this in a bacterial biosynthetic pathway, um, we, could, we did what's called, it's called a cross-coupling reaction. So if we have a molecule with a chlorine on it, um, we can use a catalyst under relatively mild conditions and substitute this um, chlorine uh, with a variety of different um, organic groups, uh, as I'm showing here. And the really nice thing about this is we can just, we can take our transformed hairy root plant tissue, we can grind it up in methanol and water, we can add in the catalyst and heat it up to 100 degrees, and then we can actually get pretty good yields of the corresponding derivatized compounds. So this is a, a nice way to sort of further elaborate on, on the structure of these um, engineered molecules. So, um, and again, as I mentioned, um, it's a very exciting prospect to think about sort of combining these ideas with the, our ability now to um, identify the pathway enzymes in a relatively more streamlined manner. And maybe we may be able to um, start thinking about heterologously expressing these enzymes um, in, a, in, a, in a host, um, a heterologous host, um, to make these types of analogs um, more efficiently and more rapidly. So with that, um, I just, I really want to thank the people um, who did all of the work. This is the current group, uh, present and past, um, and uh, these agencies for funding. And again, thank you very much um, to the organizers for um, organizing this conference. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them.